Welcome to Free Christian Church of God's video outreach ministry, bringing the gospel message of Jesus Christ into your home each and every Sunday morning. If you would like more information about the video ministry or other ministries that we have to offer, stay tuned immediately following this program. And now, open your Bibles and follow along as we bring you today's message. I know what you're thinking. Oh my, he's become one of those TV preachers. He's in a golf shirt, no socks, and he's sitting on a stool. <laughs> I guarantee you, it's only today. It's only today. Jimmy already alluded to it, uh, but I, I have to thank this church for the way you work. Um, I, I, I'm always impressed by the way everybody kind of knows what to do. Uh, when church was over a couple of weeks ago, instantly people were everywhere disassembling things, which you know, a lot of people are gifted at that, you know, they're taking things apart. But last Sunday after the program, and I know everybody was tired, after a week of Bible school, I'll tell you one thing, I am, I'm getting kind of old for Bible school. Uh, I was shot about Wednesday. I actually came into the adult class, I think it was Wednesday night, sit down back there where John and Shirley is. I understand, John, what you go through back there in that row. Uh, I, it was kind of dark in here. Of course, Jerry Bowers was teaching that night. And if you know Jerry, Jerry's got that FM radio voice. You know, it's just peaceful and calm. You know, I think Jerry, if Jerry told people we just all need to be lost and go to hell, we would all do it. You know, I just think he's so convincing. <laughs> And I'm listening to that, and I thought, well, you know, I could just kind of lay here and listen to him. I fell asleep <laughs> during the adult lesson, so I, don't lay down. Whatever you do, don't lay down back there, John. That's, that's not a good place to do it. Um, but after a week of Bible school, and the thing is, it's the results. It's the results of it. We get excited about Bible school, but I don't think it's so much the playing uh, and the excitement of it, I think it's the result of it. I really believe it comes down to whether 40 kids, anywhere from 4 years old to 17, 18 years old, that got saved during the week of Bible school. That's That's an amazing figure, you know, when you think about that. People whose lives have been prayed, they've been prayed with one-on-one -on -one whose lives have changed. Uh, because of the efforts that we put forth, which, which just tells me that, you know, if we did this all of the time, just think of how many people would be coming into the kingdom. I, I, I heard uh, the promo for the Storm Conference, and I believe there were 40 decisions made last year, uh, teenagers that accepted Christ during a storm. And we have a bigger Storm Conference this year than we've ever had. We've got more pre-registered than we've ever had pre-registered. We're looking for a bigger crowd than we've ever had, more opportunities to present the gospel and, and to see teenagers come to Christ. And I think you're going to look long and hard to find another place that, that puts that much effort into bringing people into the kingdom of God. And I'm proud of that. I am proud of that, uh, that this church is based upon winning the lost to the Lord. About getting rid of people's past and giving them a new start. And, and I want you to know I really appreciate all of the work that you do because you go, you go above and beyond. I really appreciate that. If you have the Bible with you this morning, I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 3. And I want to read to you beginning in verse 13. We're going to have just a brief message here and then uh, we're going to invite people forward to be baptized. If you are a born again Christian and you've never been baptized, uh, I think it's important that you are baptized, that you tell the world this is what happened to me. And I want to explain to you a little bit of how it works today before we have the baptism service itself. And then I want to invite you, even if you didn't come prepared to be baptized, uh, we every year for the last 28 years, I've always baptized people on Sunday morning that came to church not knowing they were gonna be baptized until the baptism service, and that's okay, your clothes will dry. We have a towel for you. Uh, God will speak to you, listen to what he says. Matthew chapter three, verse 13 says, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and why do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. 
At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Father, we pray today for your anointing over this word. And God, I pray that the word will do something in the hearts of the people that are listening. God, that this Sunday might open things up in some people's lives. And God, open things up in the church. God, is as we present the good news, God, might we receive it the way you intend it. In Jesus' name, amen. However unintentional, there are some things that we don't understand, especially in the church. You know, we, we, in the church, we do our little things. You know, we have our rites and our rituals that we perform and that we take part in that we really don't know a whole lot about. And baptism is one of those things. About a year ago, uh, our little granddaughter, Shana, who was about three years old at the time, she came to me one morning. She was holding her forehead, and she said, Papa, my headache hurts in my head. And I took her to her Nana, and I asked if Nana had an aspirin or baby aspirin or something she could give her. Well, Lisa had some baby Tylenol, and she poured it into a medicine cup, and she gave it to Shana. Now, Lisa turned around, and she was putting the medicine back in the cupboard, so she didn't see what happened, but I was watching it. She only took the little cup of, of Tylenol, and she put it to her forehead. <laughs> well, that's where it hurt, right? She meant well. She thought she understood what she was supposed to do, and she thought she was doing it right. However unintentional, there are some things that we don't understand. So I want to take some time this morning to explain to you what baptism is according to the Scriptures. Ritual washing in Judaism takes two main forms. One is called the netalat yada'im, which is the washing of the hands with a cup. Simple enough. And then there is the tevila, which is a full body immersion in what they called a mikvah, which was a living, moving body of water. In the Gospels, at the time when John baptized people in the Jordan River, he would baptize people who had repented of their sins and who sought the salvation of God. That's very important to note. Repentance always preceded salvation. And repentance always preceded baptism. It wasn't the act of being baptized that turned sinners into Christians, but it was repentance. We can never turn to God until we turn away from our sin. Baptism was essentially John's altar call. He would preach his message, he would confront people's sin, he would confront the godliness in their lives, and then he would call them to repentance. And then those who heeded John's message and repented of their sins, those who were really seeking a relationship with God, would come forward and they would step into the Jordan River to be baptized by John. Now John's audience understood what John was doing. Those that John baptized were familiar with the concept of baptism and what it stood for and why they were doing it. He didn't have to explain it like we do today. As Jews, they understood the ritual cleansings of their faith. For hundreds of years, Hebrews and their ancestors practiced ceremonial cleansings. Throughout the law, God had required them to participate in certain ceremonial cleansings, uh, whether it was at meals or before worship or after sleeping or after certain bodily cycles or after touching the dead and so on. There was always some sort of a cleansing that they had to participate in. So for the Hebrew to repent of his sin and then be baptized, it wasn't anything new. The idea of being baptized wasn't foreign to them. They understood the symbolism, and they understood uh, the, 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 what they were doing in this ritual cleansing. They understood the need, and they understood the process. They understood why they needed to be fully immersed in a living, moving waters of the mikvah. However, it's not so for many people today. Most people know of baptism. They've either heard about it or they've seen people baptized or maybe even they've been baptized themselves, but they don't have a real handle on why there is the need to be baptized or what baptism truly means. We've heard that baptism is symbolic of being buried with Christ as he was buried in the tomb and then resurrecting from the baptismal waters a new person just as Jesus arose from the grave. How many of you have heard that? By association, some have confused the act of baptism with salvation itself. If you ask some people today if they were a Christian, they would answer, yes, I've been baptized. 
Or even more confusing, my parents had me baptized when I was a baby. They have confused the ritual with the reality. They have extracted the heart of baptism as God intended for it to be. And instead of baptism being an act of faith through repentance of their sins, they've turned it into a lifeless rite of the church. So I want to take just a few minutes here and explain this to you this morning. One of the most horrific deaths known to man is crucifixion. It was capital punishment of the first degree. There were no humane techniques. There were no drugs to put a man to sleep and then another to numb him so he wouldn't feel the pain. When a man was crucified, he felt all of the agony. The pain was excruciating physically and mentally. He would watch as the nails were driven through his hands and through his feet, always knowing what was coming next. But to make matters worse was the fact that the nails through the man's hands and through his feet were not what killed him. In crucifixion, when a man hung on a cross with his arms outstretched, the muscles of his neck and his chest would begin to tighten and they would close in on his chest cavity until he would have to struggle to breathe. As he hung there, he would begin to suffocate. And as he suffocated, in spite of the great pain, he would push upward on the nails in his feet and pull upward on the nails in his hands so he could take just one more breath. Our human nature drives us to live in spite of the inevitable. That's why eventually the guards would break the legs of the one being crucified so he'd no longer be able to rise to take a breath. When you truly repent of your sins, you crucify the person that you used to be. You don't just take your old living self and walk him into the grave and then walk him out the other side, but there has to be a crucifixion. You can't be saved until that old man or that old woman that you have been in the past has been put to death, but he has to be put to death by you. Nobody else can do it. The preacher can't do it. Your wife can't do it. Your husband can't do it. Your mother can't do it. Only you can crucify that old man. It is your act of faith that once and for all slays that cursed man or that cursed woman that you've been. When you crucify your old self, <coughs> it's not a clean, sanitary, humane passing. But it is a painful, horrific, graphic, gruesome, bloody death. It's mentally painful, it is mo emotionally painful, and it's spiritually painful and physically painful. With every step of the crucifixion, you know what's coming next. But you have to finish the job. It's not easy. It's horrific. The old man that you used to be will struggle to survive. He'll fight to stay alive. The old nature will do everything that it can to keep breathing. He'll push through the pain to gasp for another breath, and he'll continue to fight until you break his ability to stand. It won't be pleasant. It's not for the squeamish, but it's a horrific act. But you can't be saved until that old you is dead. When Jesus died on the cross, the whole world knew that he was dead. There was no doubt in anybody's mind that Jesus was dead. Everybody knew he was dead. If there had been just a little bit of life left in him, people would have doubted his resurrection. They would have said, well, he didn't really die. He just passed out from all of the pain. He was playing possum. He was faking it. So the world had to know that Jesus was dead. When you die to yourself, to live for God, the whole world needs to know that the old you is dead. There can be no doubt in anybody's mind, your wife needs to know that the old you is dead, your husband needs to know that the old you is dead, your family, your children needs to know that the old person you used to be is dead, your friends and the bad influences in your life that you used to hang around with need to know that the old you is dead. There can be no doubt in anybody's mind. <coughs> Once Jesus was dead, his body was placed into the tomb. When you've crucified the old man, and he's legally dead in the eyes of all, you have to put him in a place where dead people belong. You need to bury him in the grave. You don't make some heroic effort and try to bring him back. You don't hook up the defibrillator and the oxygen and call for a shot of adrenaline, but you drain him of his life's blood, and you embalm him to make sure that he never lives again, and then you put him in the grave. 
You don't keep him around for old time's sake. You don't put him on display when your old friends show up. You don't take him out of the closet when you want to make a point to your spouse or scare your children, but you put him in the grave where dead people belong. Now you have to understand that you'll have some old friends and some family members who don't want the old you to die. There will be some zombies around you, some half-dead, half-alive people that are close to you who will try to convince you that you don't have to go that far. They'll try to convince you that you can play dead while you're at church, but you can still keep him alive at home, and you can keep him alive at work, and you can still keep him alive when your old friends are around. No, the old you, the old man of sin, that cursed person that you, must, you, you used to be, <coughs> must be totally dead. There's some people who don't understand. <coughs> you're trying to put your old nature to death, but they're trying to bring him back. They'll hold a seance and they'll bring out their best tools. They'll bring out the alcohol and they'll bring in the women and they'll bring out the old hangouts and they'll bring in your old boyfriend and they'll bring out your old vices. They'll whisper in your ear your old memories and they'll try to bring the old you back from the dead. But then if they realize they can't bring him back, they might try to steal him out of the grave so nobody else will know that it's happened. They'll have a weekend at Bernie's sort of thing and drag you around and act like the old you is still alive. So you can't let him out of the grave. And you can't let those people near you. Don't let the spiritual zombies get to you. You can't let them use you, but you have to put the dead man or that dead woman in the grave, and then you have to seal the grave and post an armed guard so nobody goes in or out. And then you wait. Jesus was in the grave for three days. And he waited there until God the Father called him to life. Jesus didn't resurrect until he was commanded to rise from the dead by his Father. Why was Jesus in the grave for three days? Three days was long enough to prove to a skeptical world that he was really dead. But there was also something happening during those three days. Because it was during his time in the grave that Jesus was defeating the powers of hell. It was in the grave that Jesus confronted the devil and he took from him the keys of death and hell. It was in the grave that Jesus set free those who Satan was holding in bondage. Don't get in a hurry. Let God do his work in you. You have some enemies to defeat in your tomb. So many people want an instant change after they've said a short prayer at the altar. They want salvation to be a quick fix. But God has a work to perform in you. God needs to defeat death in you. He needs to break the devil's hold on you. He needs to take from the devil the keys to the things that have imprisoned you. Let God do his work in you. Don't be in a hurry. Jesus was in the grave three days, but when his work in the grave was finished, God the Father called him to life. Hear me today. You are not alive until the Father calls you to life. You can crucify the old you. You can embalm him and lock him in the grave, but you can't rise to life until the Heavenly Father calls you to life. Wait for his call. Wait for it, and God the Father will call you to a new life in Jesus Christ. That's what baptism means. It's an outward symbol of what has taken place in your soul. If nothing has happened in your soul, the only thing that baptism will do for you is make you wet. My grandpa used to say if you're lost and you get baptized, you just go down a dry center and you come up a wet center. Baptism can't save you. It can't wash your sin away and it can't set you free. Only the blood of Jesus can do that. If baptism could make you a Christian, Jesus would have never had to die on the cross because John was already baptizing people. But if you've repented of your sin and you've crucified your old self and you've buried that man or woman that you used to be in the grave and you've waited until the Father has called you to life, then baptism becomes your testimony to the world around you of what God the Father has done in you by the blood of Jesus Christ and the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit. That's what baptism is. Now we're going to sing another song. And when we do, if you have repented of your sins and you've invited Jesus Christ to be the Savior of your life, you've crucified that old person you used to be, you put him to death, you turned your back on the sin, you've turned toward God and said, God, I want to be different. I want to live different. I want a different life. I, I want to be a different husband or a different wife. I want to be a different father or a different mother. I want to be a different son or a different daughter. 
and you invited Christ to live at the center of your life. And now you want to be baptized because you want the world to know this has happened to me. While we're singing, I want you to come and sit right down here in these front rows. I don't care if you didn't wear baptism clothes. We have towels. But if God's speaking to your heart, in, in 28 years, I've always baptized people that didn't come planning to be baptized. But if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, you need to be obedient. You need to show the world. You need to show the world, I am not who I used to be. And let baptism be your testimony. Let's stand together as we sing. Thank you for watching today's message from Free Christian Church of God in Continental Ohio. To find out more information about Free Christian Church of God, or to receive a copy of Reverend James Fry's weekly television program, Your Life, call the church office at area code 419-596-3103 or visit our website at freecog.org and download your copy today.